Hello, church. Last week, near the end, I did this little hand illustration that we used to do in church people Bible studies for kids, whether you called them Sunday school, vacation Bible school, something like that. You'd get their hands together and they'd stick up fingers and here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door and see all the people. Why are the people of God inside walls? Where'd this all begin? This idea that if you wanted to learn about Jesus, you had to enter a building. And now we call that church. When in scripture, church meant people, gathering people anywhere, outside, at a restaurant, walking down the road, any gathering of the people of God was the church. In fact, the word even goes back further than that. Uh, it could be an HOA gathering. It could be a local government gathering. Anything where you're called out for a meeting to, to meet with each other was ecclesia. And it was only later, much later in the English language, in the 1600s, that the word church began to mean a location. And especially a location one was required to go to. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 through 16, we are called salt and light. But what is the value of salt if it never leaves the container? What is the value of light if it cannot be seen outside the walls? Why is it that it seems like churches and taverns or bars are the only places where you can't walk around and look through the windows and see what's going on. Where no, you got to get through the door. And so today, I'm going to ask us to imagine the church, reimagine the church. This is part two in a series. But this time as God's backyard. There was a vacation Bible school literature program that they they sent out a lot of churches used. I'm going to say that was back probably around 2005 or so. That was called God's Big Backyard. And I love that phrase. At that time, we lived in a housing development north of Detroit in Oakland County, Michigan. And we loved our neighbors. We got along great with our neighbors. And I don't know when it was that we realized, you know something? We're the only house in town that doesn't have children's toys somewhere in the yard, or children's play things, like a slide and the like, in the backyard. But all the kids in our neighborhood felt very comfortable crossing our yard at all times, and sometimes waving at us through the, the, the um, sliding glass doors. They, they loved us, and I was going, you know something, I, I feel good that they don't mind just walking through our yard. It makes me happy that they don't feel any threat, any fear, or any prohibition against going through the, the old people's lawn. We enjoyed that time. And what would it be like if God threw a big party in the backyard? Matt Dabbs, uh, a remarkable young man, started Backyard Church some years back, and then COVID hit, and it seemed like for such a time as this. And if you've not looked him up on YouTube, you ought to. Matt Dabbs, D-A-B-B-S, he has wonderful videos that he posts there to help us be a church that's like God's big backyard. Sadly, when it comes to inside of churches, it reminds me a bit of Las Vegas. No, not, not, not the glitter, <laughs> not the gambling, but rather they used to say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. The idea was you could go there, do whatever you wanted to, and nobody's allowed to talk about it. Well, you know, good luck with that. People have cameras and they talk. But why is it that often in church things happen and we, we think we've fulfilled God's mandate on us because we've entered a building and done certain activities which are not visible to the world, not understandable to the world. They cannot hear our songs. They do not understand what we're talking about when we use eschatological terms or ecclesiastical terms like those. Why do we think now that we have done what God has asked us to do? Especially whenever we take a look at the early church. The early church for hundreds of years was not defined by what they did when they gathered. And gathering was a come and go thing because people didn't have Sundays off for hundreds of years. They would arrive and leave as necessary throughout the day. 
There was no set time where you're all to be there, sat in your chairs, facing forward. And then at the very end, we close the worship service, if you heard that phrase, with a prayer. And everybody then can get up, talk to each other, leave, and leave the building. When nobody driving past the entire time has any clue what you did, why you did it. In fact, they don't even have much interest. Have we really done anything for God that, during that hour? By the way, there are some benefits for us. Yeah, sure. You get to be with each other. You hear beautiful music. All of that is very valid. But did it do anything for Jesus? They were, in the early centuries, a living, moving, morphing body of Christ. Temples on the move. See, you used to have to go to a temple to talk to somebody to get them to talk to God and then to get your sins forgiven. But we are told now that we are temples of the Holy Spirit and he has turned us loose into the world only for us to often run back into our safe places so that we're not available to the world to meet Jesus, to have their sins forgiven. And yeah, he said that if you forgive them their sins, their sins are forgiven. But if you don't, they're not. We have a responsibility to forgive sins and it amazes me how many people say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. They'll say only God can forgive sins, not realizing they're quoting the critics of Jesus when he healed the paralyzed man. They're not quoting Christ. They're quoting his critics. Ooh, that's got a sting. We have, I think, confused the command of Christ in many ways. He told us to go into the world, teach them, teach them how to follow me, baptize them, and teach them again. That's what Matthew 28 does. Teach, baptize, teach. We go into our communities when we do and invite. That's different. Anybody that makes it past the front door, you know, they're welcomed. They're loved. I, you know, some churches, no. And I get that. A lot of us have had that. Gone into a, uh, a strange church building, gone through the worship and left and not had one person talk to us. We get that. That happens. And, and that does offend us, although it, that always makes me kind of shake my head because I go to sporting events all the time and I'll walk in, do the whole thing, walk out and nobody's talked to me either and I'm not offended. But in a church, come on, people. Why, um, why are we demanding that they come in? Most churches, I, in my experience, somebody will talk to you. Somebody will greet you. There'll be a smile. And that's a good thing. But why do they have to come in to get that? Because they, I, do you know how hard it is to walk into a strange building? A lot of people don't because every building they've walked into has had the franchise name on the top. That's their preferred franchise. But even then, it's a little bit shaky for some. What would it be like to go visit with somebody that, well, you don't even know. It's interesting that some people of our safe harbor have actually moved the television outside or put a projector on a screen outside in, in warm weather so neighbors don't even have to come into the house and feel trapped. And of course, Backyard Church encourages that as well. We have not been told to go and tell them to come. We've been told to go right out in the middle of them, teach them. Teach them how to follow Jesus. People, especially now, after all these hard resets that we've had in our culture and in our world, are not terribly interested in going into a church with walls. Now, there are mega churches that are still growing. But if you do the work and do the research, you'll find that they are growing by taking sheep from other pastures. These churches out there that are dying, some of them move to another place. It's not creating new believers as a rule. Now, we, there are exceptions to this. Our dear friend of um, our safe harbor, Devin Pickard, out in Centerville, is a pastor of Hope Church, and they baptize more adults per capita, you know, the size of their congregation, than almost any place I've seen. But that is so rare. Most of the time we baptize our kids some of them, and call it a win, people just aren't 
attracted to coming and sitting down in a strange church. But you know what they are attracted to? People that are feeding the homeless, people that are storing food pantries, clothing pantries, people that are helping people that are in distress, perhaps helping them with their finances, perhaps helping them by painting a porch or by building something, you know, replacing a roof. They are real interested in people that are out there doing for others. And they'll join you. We talked a lot about that in the Community of God series. Stephen Connor, who wrote that backyard, um, God's Big Backyard stuff, I think he did back in the day, said if they play in your backyard and they play in your front yard, then maybe someday they'll come in and play on your house. But before people will come and meet you on your turf, they have to meet you on their turf. Why don't people just want to show up? <coughs> well, they may have had bad experiences. They might have negative perceptions of Christians. A good friend of mine, Don McLaughlin, talked about how he had struggles getting the people he was wanting to come into the building. And he has a heart for the people that nobody else has a heart for. Uh, Philip Yancey talks about the story about how they'd even come to the parking lot, but then couldn't come into the building. Uh, on more than one instance, he had people that were physically sick in the parking lot, terrified of the judgment they might receive walking in. Others, they just assume we're all hypocrites. And they'll just you know, throw us away, won't even consider this. Others don't know what to do during worship. When do I stand? When do I sit? What do I do? Others have that fear of being on the outside. Others just don't see why. Why would you do that? It's Sunday morning. You get to re relax a bit. What's the point? They don't know because we weren't in their lives to show them the benefit of Christ. We didn't go. We went, we built, we sat, and we created attractive things such as come listen to our gospel meeting or we're going to do a, a thing on how to raise kids or the like, that attraction model, and it's not working anymore because if somebody wants to know how to raise their kids, they've got 10,000 websites they can, they can use that for. doesn't work. There's something about the name of Jesus that we need to put to work. Archimedes said that if you give me a, a, a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, I can move the world. He was one of the first to describe how we could use simple tools to greatly magnify the power of a human being. The name of Jesus is the one lever that can lift this world. And the world needs to hear it. And they're not going to come to where we are safely ensconced to hear it. They're going to have to see it in you. They're going to have to make that the only possible explanation for the way that you live your life before they're ready to hear it from you. And they may never be ready to make it into that building, but they're going to watch and learn about Jesus if they watch and learn about you. Because that's who we are. We're ambassadors of Christ. We are to put on Christ, as Galatians 3 tells us. One name is transformative. All the other names are not. In Acts chapter 3, there were days of prayer. Prayer marked the day as well. Every day had at least two times of prayer. Some special events had three times of prayer in the early church. And they had really brought that in from Judaism. Uh, the early church was very, very, very Jewish in its character and in its teaching. One of these ordinary days... At the three o'clock in the afternoon time to pray, Peter and John approached the beautiful gate. Now, you don't get three guesses on why it's called the beautiful gate. It was the most beautiful of the gates through which you entered the temple grounds. It was made of expensive bronze and it was kept burnished so that it would shine when the, the sunshine hit it brightly like a beacon of heaven calling you in to the temple. It was the main entrance, uh, which makes all the sense in the world, frankly. It was also the largest of the gates, and therefore the largest, the most beautiful, the main gate is the beautiful gate. Beggars 
and the handicapped, the maimed, none of those were allowed to go through this gate. For reasons that sometimes bother us in the Old Testament, if you had any visible disability, you were not allowed to enter the temple. And in fact, there were some disabilities that if they weren't even visible, you're not allowed to go into the temple. And so all of the beggars, remember, they're, they're, this is their job. But they've got no other way to make money. You know, they could be unable to walk or unable to see. Uh, they might have a variety of those. They would be arrayed on the 15 steps from the courtyard up to the beautiful gate. And you'd have to weave your way past the beggars to enter the gate. Now, a very huge part of Judaism uh, was alms, giving benevolence, giving money, food, and care to the beggars, the poor, the maimed. Uh, it's supposed to be a big part of Christianity, too. You might want to check your, your line item, item budgets to see if it is. Uh, it's, it was a big deal to them. Also, it's a big deal in Islam, by the way. It's one of the, their big rules. Well, Peter and John are walking up there, these 15 steps. I want you to imagine what it must feel like to walk past all these people who cannot enter the gate. All of their life, they're brought out there by their families, they're parked, and they can never enter the temple grounds, much less the temple. Forget about that. It, they're unacceptable. They are other. They will never fit in with the shiny, happy people, to borrow a REM phrase, inside the temple gates. Makes me hurt for them. Where are they going to worship? Where, where are they going to find joy? One man there had never walked. He couldn't move unless some other human being had mercy on him and moved him. Much of his life, maybe all of his life, had been spent on these steps outside the house of God. What would you have felt like if you were that man? Bored? Oh, sure. Humiliated every day. In despair? Often. Angry? Well, you'd have to be a better man than me never to be angry about that. Bitter? I think so. How many people would make eye contact with you as they are shuffling through? As they're going up to worship. How many people would have looked you in the eye and acknowledged you as a human being and then formed a connection with you? You know the answer to this. I've lived in the Detroit area. I've lived in other areas. But you don't have to be in a big major city to all of a sudden come upon the poor. Come upon those who are shoved out of society because of something. It could be all of their bad decisions. It could be addictions. It could be loss of job and then you know, COVID hits and there's no way for you to get back into work and you know, the money runs out. We all know this can happen and does happen. And therefore, we, we walk past them. Hey, and I'm aware, I'm very aware that a lot of people that go out there with the signs you know, we're hungry, we'll work for food, have no intention to work, that is their job, and they make more money than other people because people, they're cheating people. They're playing on people's emotions. The thing is, we don't know which one's which. And it's really, that's a tough call to make. I think that may be why God has left it to us rather than saying, all right, here's the rule for everybody at all times. But regardless, we tend not to make eye contact with very many? Have you ever been in a part of the world where they say the kids are going to run up to you screaming for food and coin and help? Do not make eye contact with them because if you do, they will swarm the bus. We will never get out of here. How did you feel when you heard that? I remember how I felt first time and second time, third time. It's tough. How many had just hustled by this man in his lifetime? And then Peter and John are walking up. In Acts chapter 3, he says, you know, have mercy on me. And Peter and John stop. Why? 
because a human being has spoken to them. That is more important than getting through the gate early. Boy, that's hard to figure out. But a human being was speaking to them. So they stop and they look down. This, is, this story is in Acts 3, by the way. It's a great, 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 great story. He asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And now we know that the beggar wasn't even hopeful enough to look at them. He just had his head down. So Peter, first reaction, looked straight at him. I told people this last weekend as I was in another city that if Jesus were to come to Spring Hill and spend a couple of weeks, I live in a town called Spring Hill, uh, I don't think he'd come to see me. And I think there were a few raised eyebrows among the group, but I said, no, I think he would spend all that time going to see the people whom I have failed to see. And then every head started nodding. They got it. They got it. It's a good group. Peter was going to see this guy. But he also said, look at us. He's not afraid to make a connection. In fact, making a connection is what God has called him to do. And us, you and me. And we can make it through this, this church more easily than we can do in almost any other way. Because there aren't the fearful walls. There aren't the, I'm trapped now, how do I get home? There's none of the, what pressure will be put upon me? None of that. And in fact, our people do their best work as they live their lives. Not in an intensive hour on a Sunday morning. So the man gave him, gave them his attention, expecting, the Bible says, to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, which is a wonderful phrasing, but it's another way of just saying, I've got no money. But what I do have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, don't you wish you could do that? Oh, my goodness. I wish I could do the miracles. I would walk up and down every, every hospital. I'd start probably with St. Jude's over in Memphis. Those poor, poor children. And just heal, 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 heal. I'd love to do that. But that's not the point of this story. Do you remember I said last week that the miracles are the least impressive part of the stories if you take a look at what's really being, what's really going on? I know it's hard to get past that, and I don't want to ever demean the miracle. I mean, come on. We'd all love to be able to do this or have somebody do that for us. But there's something else going on here that is lost because we look at the miracle. So hang with me, would you? Peter says, walk. Well, the man didn't pop up. The, the next line says that taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and angles became strong. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Yay, that's a great story. I believe it happened. Not a great story. No, that's, that's not the story. That's not the story. Then he went with them into the temple. He had always been locked out. Never good enough. Never allowed. He was one of those people who don't belong here. But because he met Peter and John, he's invited to the big backyard party. He can walk in now. He can walk out. He is free in Christ even though he probably didn't know the name of Christ. He's going to. The Bible says, walking, jumping, praising God. Aren't you so glad that he wasn't walking into one of those churches that said, stop with the jumping. Stop with that. We know you're saved and going to heaven now, but try not to be happy about it. Years and years ago, my wife and I went to Jamaica um, and it was, I, I'm not going to try to, it was, it was on a cruise. It wasn't on a big church mission. 
But we had taken, I think it was 90 some people with us. And it wasn't one of those where we go free because we, we, everybody paid the same. That was my rule. And we were having a good time. And this one young lady was our tour guide for a bus of us that were going to the Duns River Falls. Many of you have been there. <coughs> but as I watched her, I said, that woman's in pain. Because that's one of the things I'm trained to see. And so I told Cammie, I said, when we get there and everybody gets off the bus, let's hang back a bit. So everybody got off the bus. And I got up close to her, took Cammie, because I don't want her to feel like I'm very uncomfortable, you know, this white man coming right up to her. And I said, um, sister, are you hurting? And she got embarrassed and, you know, kind of like afraid that if we could tell, everybody could tell, and she might lose a tip or something. She's going, yeah. It's, it's, it. I said, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. This is what I do. I said, how are you hurting? Where does it hurt? And she was having a migraine. Can you imagine having a migraine and having to stand in a bus looking backwards as it drives forwards trying to entertain all oh mine? I said, do you have any medication for it? She goes, no, I don't. And I said, what would you take if you were home? Uh, she goes, do you have medicine? I said, I couldn't help but kid. I said, we're all from Detroit. We have everything. You know, what do you need? And she told me what she took. We had medicine for that. Uh, so we began a conversation because she had been seen, talked to, acknowledged in her pain. We had a conversation. And she goes, where are you guys from? And I said, well, we're church people that have decided to go on a cruise with each other. And lo and behold, it came down to the name of our particular church franchise or family. And she goes, oh, we have one of those here in Ocho Rios. And I, I said, I know you do. Yes. She goes, I went there once. After, as soon as it came out of her mouth, you could see that she wished she hadn't put the once. I said, sister, what happened? She goes, oh, no, they were really good people. I said, listen, it's okay. It's okay. We understand. Tell me what happened. She goes, well, I really enjoyed the, I, I just like to praise Jesus. She'd done a little bit too much walking and jumping. And she'd been told by our respectful, reverent people, we don't do that here. What a shame. What a heartbreaking, unnecessary thing to do to a lively, happy, young, worshiping woman. Here in a temple, nobody's stopping him. In fact, it says they recognized him as the same guy that used to sit begging at the temple gate. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. You see, there's the thing. There's the thing. It's not the miracle. They did the miracle so they could bring him inside. Bringing him inside the family of worship. That's what this is about. That man will talk to his neighbors about, I can walk around now. But the highlight of his day was getting, and of his life, was getting to go into the temple. When the crowd of people came around, to uh, say, what is going on here? The onlookers, if you read the rest of this, Peter tells him about Jesus. He brings the name of Jesus in, and he, he links it to the joy and the freedom and the salvation in Christ. And here's where salt and light enter into it again, because you see, salt and light are, all, are just, they're welcomed, unless they aren't. Three o'clock in the morning, someone flicks the light switch on, not welcome. If you're having an ear of corn or you're having some green beans, salt, probably welcome. If you're having ice cream, not welcome. When we do what we're supposed to do and invite people into God's big backyard with love and grace, we will offend some people by who we let in. And they'll be angry because salt and light, they attract and they repel. Peter and John will spend the night in jail for the gift they gave the beggar. They were just going to go worship. But they allowed themselves to be interrupted by the moment. You see, God is in the interruptions. He's in the unplanned moments. He's there if you turn around and have a look 
at what's around you and do what we always say. Do what you can with what you've got to whomever is there. Sometimes they're going to rush you and want to be baptized and know all about this. Other times they may want to put you in jail. But they can't remain neutral. Salt and light doesn't let you be neutral. Do you remember the Good Samaritan story? Two people were too busy to go to church and they, they didn't have time for him. But the one who allowed the victim of a robbery to interrupt their days and interrupt their plans, that's the one Jesus praised. Verse 10 says they were all filled with, in Acts 3, all filled with amazement and wonder. Hmm. Makes me wonder. How much amazement and wonder do we have in our worship? I think we have some. I I do. But I find in my life and in the lives of people I've talked to, there's much more amazement and wonder when we're turned loose into the world with Jesus on our lips and in our actions. So if I may, as we wrap this up, stop waiting for the call. Stop looking for the big thing. And understand that you might never even see the big picture. Think of Disney's first uh, animated feature-length film, Snow White. It took three years to make it. Each frame, each drawing was one twenty-fourth of a second seen. That's all. That's all. While it was being made, it was ridiculed. Everybody said this was going to be an absolute failure, that the man was insane. Once it was released, it became a classic for all time. Each of our days is that one twenty-fourth of a second frame. It doesn't make much sense to us. We don't see it unfolding. We don't see the movement of anything, much less the movement of God. But when God is putting the pictures together, it is a beautiful movement and a beautiful movie full of joy, walking and jumping and praising God. We pray often for God's temporary blessings, as we should. Health, money to pay the bills, safety, when God has already put before us the beautiful gate and it's open. Why didn't Peter and John heal everybody at the gate? Because that's not what it was about. It was about introducing people to Jesus that a new thing was in this world. Our safe harbor is a new way of bringing that new thing. Thank you for being with us. See what you can do this week to look around and see who you might be able to invite into God's big backyard party. It's going to be a great movie when we see it. We'll talk to you next week.